originally, although I am now Swiss. I've lived in Switzerland 17 years, in Bern the whole time, because there's nowhere else in Switzerland I would rather live. Uh, hopefully no one from Basel or Zurich or any of those horrible cities there. Um, and I write books about Switzerland. So uh, we're here this evening because my new book, Cartographica Helvetica, is out. That's actually book number eight. Uh, amazingly, I've found eight different ways of writing about Switzerland, uh, which I didn't think possible 12 years ago when the first one was published. And this evening, I'm going to talk about my new country, which I call the land of milk and money. This is actually the oldest map of Switzerland that exists. And I like to show it because one, it's, uh, it doesn't show Switzerland as we think of it. It's the world is Switzerland, Switzerland is the world, which is what many Swiss people believe still today anyway. So you have a circular Switzerland surrounded by the heavenly stars. In the middle, you have Mount Rigi. Uh, this was drawn by a monk in Einsiedel Monastery. His name was Albrecht von Bonstetten, and it was 1479. So he drew his world. And you can see the eight cantons that then existed the most obvious one is just to the left, is Zug, Z-U-G. Name hasn't changed in 500 years. Zug hasn't changed in 500 years, really. Um, and at the bottom, you can see Turigum, which is the very old name for Zurich. Now, what fascinated me about this map when I first saw it, sadly, it's not in Switzerland. It's in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. This was drawn in 1479, and yet I looked at it and saw Switzerland today. Those heavenly stars are the EU flag with Switzerland as a whole at the middle. And if you look at the map of the EU, it is with Switzerland as a whole in the middle. So this monk looked 500 years into the future and drew modern Switzerland. Next slide. Shady is my clicker. Um, so I'm going to talk to uh, today about Swissness. Is this wonderful English sounding word, which doesn't actually exist in English. It's a made up word. You won't find it in any dictionary. And that's because the Swiss made it up in the 90s to describe how they feel about themselves, about their country. And with four national languages, it's kind of hard to think of one word that everyone would understand, so you make up an English word instead. And Swissness is great because it means something different to everyone, because there's no formal definition. So it can mean whatever you want it to mean, whether you're a Swiss or whether you're a foreigner. So I'm just going to... Um, give a little bit of my idea of Swissness, having lived there 17 years, most of that time as a foreigner. Next slide. And it's just letter by letter, very simple. The first S is for socializing. Now, the Swiss have a reputation, kind of justified on the whole, of being quite cold and distant, keeping your arm's length the whole time, taking a long time to get to know you. And it's one of the things that foreigners find most difficult about integrating or about coming to terms with life in Switzerland is that everyone's quite formal to begin with. Um, Neighbours don't drop around with cups of coffee and freshly baked muffins. Um, but there's one moment when all that goes out the window and the Swiss are actually very social and very forward. And that's the Swiss idea of socialising. And it's at a, an apero is like a drinks party. So you go to an apero or any dinner party or any party. Um, and if you're me, shy, retiring Englishman that I was and still am, uh, you don't know anyone in the room apart from the hosts. And so you go and get a drink and then you hide in the corner. Uh, the worst thing you could possibly do is go around and intrude in people's conversations to uh, introduce yourself. Now, the first time this happened, uh, my lovely host, appeared within a minute or two and he said why are you being so rude and I said how can I be rude I'm not speaking to anyone he said exactly <laughs> and I learned with what you have to do is go around shake hands make eye contact and introduce yourself to everyone who is already in the room it's very painful for a British person <laughs> even worse is when you come to leave a few hours later you're meant to go around shake hands make eye contact and remember the person's name that you learnt three hours and 17 drinks ago. It's really hard. Um, so I have two tips, and these work every time. Arrive first. This is the real reason why Swiss people are punctual. Because if you arrive first, you get your drink, 
and you stand there. Everyone else has to do the work because they arrive after you. They have to do the round of introductions. You're not doing anything. It's great. And then when it comes to leaving, wait until someone else is leaving, follow a couple of steps behind, <laughs> listen into them apologizing, say, oh, I've forgotten your name, I'm awfully sorry. And then you come along and say, well, goodbye, Emily, it was lovely to meet you. So everyone thinks you've remembered every name in the room, but of course you're cheating. And no one cheats in Switzerland. Well, not in public anyway. Next slide. W of Swissness. Oh, no, we missed out the W. w oh, no, going the wrong way, wrong way, wrong way. Back, back, back. Oh, my apologies. So that's okay. Um, the W of Swissness is for weather. Now, if you're British, you, you can talk about the weather at the drop of a hat. It's the way to start any conversation. It's the way to fill an uncomfortable silence. It's the way to create small talk to get to know someone. In Switzerland, small talk is typically quite small because it feels uncomfortable. It feels like you're intruding in someone's private space. Um, and a typical conversation that I have experienced and overheard is let's say it's like this beautiful picture of um, this January and I come in from outside and say, oh, it's cold out there. And the typical Swiss response is, well, it's winter. <laughs> and that kills the conversation really. Whereas in Britain, we would then go on and say, yes, but last week we're in t-shirts or next week we're gonna have a meter of snow and you build a conversation. So small talk is quite uncomfortable for a lot of people. Uh, my boyfriend who is Swiss doesn't find it easy. So we were at a wedding in Britain a few years ago. And first of all, he did the classic Swiss mistake of going around and introducing himself to everyone who was there. <laughs> And you could see people looking at him thinking, why does he think he's so important that everyone in the room has to know who he is? He's not even the bride or the groom. And then we were sitting at a table with eight people we didn't know would never meet again. And about halfway through, he said to me in German, he said, what's the point of this? Why am I talking to this woman about her knitting project in New York? It's really not that interesting. I'm never going to see her again. I said, because it's better than sitting in silence. No, it's not. Um, so for a lot of Swiss people to get used to it, especially if they've lived abroad or work with foreigners or have a foreign partner, but for a lot of Swiss people, it's still quite uncomfortable. As one friend of mine said to me, he said, why talk about the weather? You can just look out the window and see what it's doing. You don't actually need to discuss it, which is a very practical Swiss attitude. Now the I. So, I is for information. When I research my books, uh, I love finding out facts to put in there, especially facts that people have never heard of before. And what I love about Switzerland is the Swiss government is very precise and correct and has a lot and lot of information online, um, which was great during the pandemic when I was researching Cartographica, everything was shut, all the libraries were shut. And so luckily I could find a lot of information online. Because the Swiss love nothing more than counting things, tabulating things, making sure everything is in the right place and correct. And this map um, actually comes from one of my books uh, called Around Switzerland and 80 Maps, which uh, came out about six years ago, but is still around. And this is 1941. So the rest of the world was quite busy. Uh, Switzerland wasn't. Um, so they counted their pigs. And not only did they count the pigs and make a beautiful map, but they uh, classified the map. So you can see the yellow areas are the Edelschwein or noble pig, and the pink areas are the Landschwein or common pig, and then the blue areas are the mixed breeds. So that you know in every district what is the majority pig and the minority pig. And then the bottom right, there's the tiny map, which is the Schweinedichtigkarte or the pig density map to show you where all the pigs lived in 1941. So this is crucial information, obviously. Um, they all lived in Torgau near Lake Constance. Now, I love this map. It sat in the archives in Zurich, uh, Cantonal Library, for decades with no one paying it any attention, really. And I saw it and said, this is the perfect Swiss map for me. It's so much detail, uh, but so easy to understand because it's visual. The archivist thought I was a little bit crazy that I wanted it in my book. Um, but of course, there's a really serious reason behind the map. Switzerland in 1941 was surrounded by the Axis powers, was cut off. 
it had to know how much food it had. So they counted all the animals, not only the pigs, but sheep, cows, goats, horses, chickens, everything. And every animal had its own map. Sadly, the pig map is the only one from the original census that survives. But the census itself survives. Every five years, the Swiss count all their animals. So I know from the latest census that there are 1.6 million pigs in Switzerland. They almost outnumber cows, even though cows are much more famous. And most of the pigs these days live in Canton Lucerne. Canton Lucerne has more pigs than people. And yet you never see a pig when you're wandering around Lucerne or hiking. And so one day I was in Lucerne and I thought, well, I'm gonna try and find out. So I went into the tourist board. They probably weren't expecting this question. Uh, and my question was, where are all the pigs? <laughs> And she did say, well, we've never been asked that before. Uh, and she couldn't answer. She actually didn't know where the pigs were. Um, and I have yet to find out where the pigs are. Uh, someone, I'm not sure whether they were serious or not. Someone said most of the pigs are actually kept underground, bred underground, but that doesn't sound very healthy. But it is rare to see pigs, especially 1.6 million of them. Next slide. S is for a word that does not exist in any of the Swiss national languages, spontaneity. There are translations for it, of course, in French, German, Italian, and Romance, but no one really uses it or understands it. And I learned this the hard way, as I did with most things, actually. When I arrived 17 years ago, no one told me about this, least of all my boyfriend. And so all of my mistakes uh, were self-induced, and um, but gave me good material for books. So when I arrived, I didn't speak German. I went to school every morning, intensive German course, starting with Daddy Das, uh, which I still haven't mastered even. It's like, why is a table masculine? It's not logical. Um, and then the afternoons, I had been visiting Bern quite often. Uh, so I knew the city, I knew where some of our friends lived. And I'd be walking down the street and think, oh, so-and-so lives there. So I'd knock on the door, as you would, in almost any other country, if you're in the neighborhood, you go and say hello. And if they were home, they would say, oh, do we have an appointment? And I was like, well, you're not my doctor, so no. <laughs> and we'd stand on the doorstep making uncomfortable small talk for a little bit, and I would realize that I wasn't going to be invited in. And this happened a couple of times with a couple of different friends, and so I said to my boyfriend, am I? doing something wrong? Should I like always have a gift ready in case? And he said, but you haven't let them know that you're coming. I said, well, I didn't know. It was a spontaneous decision. He said, well, that's the mistake. Mm -hmm. So I now plan my spontaneity, which is a very Swiss concept. I might send a text to a friend saying, on Friday, if it's nice weather, and I don't feel like working anymore, I'll go for a walk. And maybe around 11 o'clock, I could pass by your door. And if you happen to be home, we could maybe have a drink together. But if you're not, it doesn't matter. And of course, they know I'm coming. So they get everything ready, buy the Ravello, buy the cookies. I'm there one minute before just to feel a little bit spontaneous. And it works. We're both happy. And I realized quite quickly that home is quite a private thing in Switzerland. It's not... Uh, like Britain or even America, where home is often an extension of yourself. And it's not the spontaneity so much, although that is a problem. It's also the privacy, um, respect each other's privacy. So it's quite normal for us to invite friends around, because I was this, being a foreigner, you can get away with quite a lot. You can sort of trample over etiquette a little bit. But then reciprocations would sometimes come in the form of going out to a restaurant rather than to someone's home until they knew that I was a safe person to have in their home. And these days, if I get a text from a friend and it says, do you want to go to the cinema tonight? Generally, I can guarantee that's an English speaking friend. If I get a text saying, do you want to come to dinner in November? Then it's a Swiss person. And I've actually got quite used to it and quite like having my calendar totally organized six months ahead so that I know exactly what I'm doing and, and when. And that possibly why they let me be Swiss because I have a bit of that control freakery about me. 
Next slide. So the next S is for Sundays. And this is one of the hardest things for English speaking foreigners to get used to because Sundays still exist in Switzerland. Unlike here and in Britain, where they were abolished about 30 years ago, everything's open, you can do whatever you want, it's the same as any other day. Um, in Switzerland, they are still special. It doesn't mean you necessarily go to church, um, but it means the shops are shut. Shocking, I know. Um, and I worked six years in a Swiss bookshop, and it was great. After six years in a British bookshop, suddenly I had every Sunday off instead of working every other Sunday. Um, and it's more about work-life balance. It isn't to punish retailers. Um, and there are occasionally votes on opening on Sunday and generally it, it goes against them. So Sundays, the shops are still shut. But there are other things you can't do on a Sunday either. Um, again, I learned the hard way. We'd had some friends around one Saturday and we had a few wine bottles left. I had time Sunday morning, so I took them to the bottle bank. And they make quite a loud noise, but I was saving the planet. So I only put two in and this woman came onto her balcony gesticulating and shouting. In those days, I had no idea what she was saying. And she pointed to the sign and it was very clearly written there, Monday to Saturday, eight till eight. Those were the recycling hours. So if you want to save the planet, you have to wait till Monday morning. God will understand. Um, there are also... Generally, you can't make noise. It depends on the building you live in, but things like noisy DIY or outdoor barbecues with music or even mowing the lawn. In some buildings, the laundry room is shut. So it's quite common for Swiss apartment buildings to have a com common laundry room rather than individual washing machines. We're very liberal in our building. We can do washing whenever we want. But I know of people whose laundry rooms are shut and locked on a Sunday and they have to wait till Monday to do their washing. So what do Swiss people do on a Sunday if they can't go shopping or any of the other things? Well, go to the cinema, go to museums, visit friends as long as you've told them you're coming. Or if you're very, very Swiss, you go for a hike. And when the scenery is like this, this is the Alech Glacier in Paris or glacier, I should, should say, so that you guys understand my English. Um, I used to like walking, and then I moved to Switzerland, and I discovered very quickly my boyfriend is a keen hiker, as are most of our friends. And my idea of a Sunday walk, having grown up in the south of England, is two or three hours, gentle hills, pub at the end. The first time I went with our friends, we got up at six o'clock in the morning, voluntarily on a Sunday, so that we could catch the train along with half the world to get to the mountains while the weather was still good. And then we'd hike and it was beautiful. Uh, and we'd hike for another hour and it's still beautiful and we'd hike for another hour. And I was beginning to think we'd seen that mountain three times and we were going round in circles. Never any sign of any pub anywhere at all. Height differences of hundreds of meters going up and down. That was the first and last time I did that with my friends. I now let them get up at six. I get up at eight, have a leisurely breakfast, pack a picnic lunch, catch an empty train. When I get to the mountain, I take a cable car up. That's why they're there. I meet my friends. We have a lovely panorama hike at high altitude for two, three hours, enjoy a nice lunch. I take the mountain train down. Again, that's why they're there. And we're all happy. And what I love about that is they don't mind. Um, I don't mind. And it's actually a little bit of British history in Switzerland. A lot of the infrastructure we take for granted uh, in the Swiss mountains is, was built for lazy British tourists in the 19th century. Um, because they came to Switzerland, it was the first mass tourist destination after Thomas Cook created his first package tours. And they wanted to do Switzerland uh, in two weeks. It was the first holiday destination. And so if you've got tourists, then you build hotels, you build train lines. Cows don't need trains. Um, so the infrastructure, which is still there, was generally built for the British. So it's a little bit of my heritage that we gave to Switzerland. Next slide. N is for neutrality, which is one of those aspects of Switzerland in the outside world that is particularly famous. 
um, is noticeable just a few months ago when Switzerland adopted sanctions against Russia. The headlines around the world were about Swiss abandoning neutrality and Joe Biden even mentioned it in his State of the Union address. And so it's one of these aspects of Switzerland, along with cheese and chocolate, that the whole world knows about. And it was interesting for me when I was researching my first book, Swiss Watching, um, one of the first bits of uh, public research that I did is I went to London and stopped random strangers in the street and said, if I say Switzerland, you say. And the answers were immediate. It's a bit like family feud. We asked 100 people and here are the top answers. And it was cliched answers like cheese, chocolate, trains, watches, banks, neutrality. Um, and so that became part of my impression of Switzerland. Everyone had an answer. It wasn't like as if I had asked them about Bulgaria and they were thinking, oh, Bulgaria, do I know anything about Bulgaria? Similar sized country. And yet Switzerland has this reputation much, much bigger than Switzerland itself. Switzerland is only twice the size of New Jersey, only has eight and a half million people. So it is not a big country, but it has a big reputation. And neutrality is part of that. So this map, which is also in around Switzerland and 80 maps, is an escape map. It was printed by the British during the Second World War, and it was given to every Allied pilot flying a mission over Europe so that if they were shot down, they could find their way to Switzerland, which, as we know from the sound of music, was the place to go if you were trying to escape the Nazis. And it was printed on silk, which sounds relatively easy because lots of things are printed on silk. The trouble with that is, up until this point, it was never waterproof. So printing on silk was fairly useless if it was going to wash off if you were shot down in the rain. And it took them a while, but the British Secret Service, under a man called Christopher Clayton Hutton, developed printing that was waterproof, and he used pectin. The way we set jam, he set the ink with pectin. It was such a, such a success. They started with this Swiss map, and they ended up printing sectional maps of the whole of Europe, and two and a half million maps were printed and given to pilots and also smuggled into POW camps so that if they escaped, they could find their way to safety. You can see this one is fairly pristine, um, neatly folded. It's in the Zurich Cantonal Library. There's actually also a second copy in the Imperial War Museum in London, but very few of the original maps survived. And the advantage, the other advantage of printing them on material is they could be used as bandages or as emergency dressings. But also, if you're hiding in a bush, they don't rustle when you open them, so they don't give away your hiding place. So Swiss neutrality has always played a role in Swiss history. They haven't been invaded since Napoleon wandered in, um, and the borders have remained the same since 1815, which is quite unusual for a European country when you think of what's happened in the last 100 years. It's pretty much Portugal, San Marino, Switzerland, they're the countries who have kept their borders. And neutrality has been part of that. Geography is also part of that. Belgium was neutral in both world wars. It did not save Belgium from being invaded. So neutrality isn't the only aspect. I think Switzerland's position, its terrain, its topography helped it a lot as well. Next slide. E is for Emmentaler, or as you guys call it, Swiss cheese. Um, my favorite bit is the whole. I eat that and then leave the rest. Uh, it's really not my favorite Swiss cheese. And I remember the first time I came here after I'd moved to Switzerland. So it was probably around 2012. And I was in a deli and they said, cheddar or Swiss for my sandwich. And I, was, I really wanted to say, yeah, but which Swiss cheese? There are 450 types of Swiss cheese, but obviously they just meant the plastic with the holes in. And it's the same in Australia. I was there four years ago on a book tour and it's also just called Swiss cheese. What I like about it isn't the cheese itself. It's the fact that a lot of people all around the world identify this with Switzerland. It's a product that is more famous than the country itself. And Switzerland has a lot of products that are famous. Cooker clock is one of them, even though it's originally German from the Black Forest. And what fascinates me about Switzerland in this respect is it has no natural resources, really. It has cows, wood, and water, and pigs, as we know. 
There are only so many things you can make from cows, wood and water. So what Switzerland typically does, has always done, import something of low value, make something of high value to export it. And the classic example is chocolate. There are no cocoa trees in Switzerland. I always point that out. The cocoa has to come from West Africa or South America. It is then made into chocolate. And that was a very typical Swiss innovation. Up until 1875, chocolate was a bitter drink that you mixed with water and milk and sugar to make palatable. No one had ever managed to make a solid milk chocolate bar that anyone wanted to eat. And then in 1875, dismantled Daniel Peter, who lived in Vevey, made the first chocolate bar. And it became instantaneously synonymous with Switzerland. 19th century chocolate bars, no matter where they were sold, tend to have bucolic Swiss mountain scenes on them to help sell them. He managed it. His father-in-law was Francois-Louis Caillet, who had the oldest chocolate factory in Switzerland. It still exists. Caillet is still a brand. And his friend who lived down the road was a man who had just invented condensed milk, and his name was Henri Nestlé. And so he took the milk, the thick sweet milk, and his father-in-law's bitter chocolate and created a chocolate bar. Peter's chocolate was one of the most famous brands for a long time. It then became part of, Caillé became part of Nestle, it has disappeared. But it was so well known and so popular that during the Second World War, um, it was Churchill's favorite brand of chocolate. So the Nazis even came up with a plan to assassinate him by injecting strychnine into a chocolate bar and sending it to him, thinking that because it's Swiss chocolate from Switzerland, no one would suspect that it was poisonous. Now, obviously it didn't work. But again, that Swiss neutrality was, they were hoping to bank on that. But interestingly, um, Swiss inventors, Swiss companies are as modest as most Swiss people. A lot of Swiss people don't like to boast about their achievements. And there are lots of inventions that are Swiss that are just not that well known for being Swiss. So stock cubes, cellophane, tin foil, electric toothbrush, LSD, absinthe, really normal everyday things. <laughs> All of them Swiss inventions. And yet very few people know that those things are Swiss inventions because invent something and then not tell the world about it is quite a Swiss trait. Next slide. So S is for Switzerland itself, um, which might sound a bit strange as the whole talk is about Switzerland, but I always like to point out that Switzerland is really a country that shouldn't exist. It has no one language. It has four. It is fairly evenly divided between Catholic and Protestant. It has no natural borders, really, unlike an island nation. And it has survived despite having no one in charge for 700 odd years. No president, no emperor, no king, no general. No one person or party or group is ever in control. And in German, Switzerland is referred to as a Willensnation, which means it's a country because it wants to be a country. It exists purely because the people want to, it to exist and have done for the last 700 plus years. So it started with three cantons standing up to the bad guys. Now, those days, the bad guys were the Habsburgs, the Austrians. They still are, if you're talking skiing or ice hockey. <laughs> um, and the bad guys have changed over the years. So then it was Napoleon, then it was the Nazis. Now it's the EU. It's external threats, keeping the Swiss together, knowing that they are stronger if they are together. And it's always been a country that is for the people, by the people, with the people. So it hasn't always been purely democratic, but it is now. Things happen very slowly because decisions are taken generally by the people, important decisions. So tomorrow is voting day in Switzerland. I voted before I left. And we're voting on things like organ donation, on money to the frontiers in European Union. Even though Switzerland is not a member of the European Union, it is kind of an associate member, it's part of the single market for goods, and it gives money every now and then when it's feeling benevolent. Um, and these things are decided by the people. And it is cumbersome. Women didn't get the vote till 1971. And that was at federal level, the last canton 
the very conservative canton happens up in the road and didn't give in for another 20 years. And only then when the Supreme Court told them to. But decisions generally when they are taken because they are taken with a lot of debate and by the people, they fall off the agenda. So cultural wars do exist. Switzerland is divided between left and right in the same way any country is. But the system of proportional representation within parliament means that no one party ever has a majority. It usually takes three parties working together to pass any legislation. Also, no one person is ever in control. The government is seven people acting together. The president is elected once a year, has no power other than shaking hands, making speeches, cannot issue executive orders, cannot rescind treaties, cannot tweet, <laughs> cannot do any of the above. Um, and it's the people who are actually the balance and the check on the politicians. They can overturn any legislation with a vote. And so you do have extremes, but the extremes are kept in check by the system and by the people, the majority of whom are in the middle. And it doesn't matter whether it's extreme left or extreme right, they rarely succeed. So for instance, to give a very topical example here, abortion was made legal in Switzerland in 2002, quite late for Europe. There was a vote and it passed. A few years later, the right wing and the Christian groups uh, collected enough signatures to trigger a second vote and it failed. And then there was a third vote and it failed. And now after three votes in the space of 10, 12 years, it is pretty much off the agenda because even those who oppose abortion know that they can have as many referendums as they want. There's no restriction. It's not Britain and Brexit. It's not one referendum and then you have to live with the result. You can have referendums as often as you want, but you still have to persuade a majority to vote for what you want. And so, although it's slow, although minorities can feel left out, so foreigners have no voting rights at federal level, it is inclusive. You can never really say, not in my name, or I wasn't asked, because it's your choice not to get involved. Every three months we have votes. So it's not perfect. I don't think any country is perfect, but it tries. And it's been trying and succeeding. I mean, it's over 700 years old, so it's obviously doing something right somewhere along the way. Final S. So S is for Swinglish, which is Swiss English. So the four national languages are on the map. Green is French, red is German, purple is Italian, and the tiny orange bits are the 30,000 people who speak Romance as their first language. A lot of Swiss people speak amazing English, um, which is very helpful when you move there and don't speak any national language. But you soon realize as a native English speaker that a lot of pe Swiss people think they speak amazing English. And every now and then they're actually using Swinglish words, thinking that because it's an English word, it has the same meaning. Now these are classic false friends and every language has them with almost every other language. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So after I've been in Bern a little bit, I met a friend of ours and he said, oh, I'm so glad I bumped into you. It was only when we were in the supermarket. He said, I must get your handy number. <laughs> and I was sitting there thinking, handy, what's a handy number? <laughs> well, 27 is quite useful because we need it once a month. So I said, 27. And he looked at me and said, that's a very personalized number. And it took us a while, and then I realized that handy with a capital H in Switzerland means mobile phone or cell phone, which is a great word because it is handy. The trouble is you get so used to using this word in German and in English that I go back to Britain and I bump into a friend and say, oh, I've lost your handy number. And he's like, what is this English? <laughs> and then it's just slightly more uncomfortable moments. So um, you can imagine a very attractive young lady speaking perfect English, sitting next to an older English gentleman. She knew she had to prepare small talk topics, so she had a list. And this was at a dinner party of ours. And um, I noticed it was a bit uncomfortable. And I went over and said to her in German, I said, is everything okay? She said, oh, it just went a bit quickly and I ran out of topics. 
It was the small talk was smaller than I thought it would be. And so I improvised and talked about my hobbies. And I said, that's fine. Hobbies is a good small talk topic. I said, what happened? He said, well, he went very red and very silent. I said, what did you say? And she said, I told him I liked playing around with old timers. <laughs> now to her, which I explained to the gentleman in question, to her, that means she likes vintage cars and she does them up and takes them to rallies. Of course, to him, as an English-speaking older gentleman, it meant she liked having sex with old men. <laughs> and we hadn't even reached dessert. It wasn't really that time of, to have that conversation. So I explained to each other what had been going on, and they both went very red and very silent. Um, and then it comes down to uh, very slight differences in pronunciation. Um, and this is uh, a story that is in Swiss Watching, my first book, and I tried to have it left out because it makes me look really stupid, uh, but my editor liked it so much it survived. And actually I'm glad it did because I get a lot of emails about it. So I worked for six years in an English bookshop in Bern and most of the customers would speak English. Obviously some didn't, they were there to learn English. So if they spoke in German, we would reply in German. If they spoke in English, we would carry on in English, sometimes not the same English. So the Swiss customer came in and said, I'm looking for a book on cheeses. I said, oh, so you want, to, you want a book on cheese and go to the cookery section and get out three books on cheese. And she says, no, not cheese, cheese is. And I'm thinking, do we even have a plural of cheese in English? <laughs> but sensing it was a difficult conversation, I use her plural in the hope that we will get somewhere. I said, so you're looking for something on cheeses? Yes, she says. Holy cheeses. I said, ah, then you want something on Swiss cheeses, being the only holy cheese there is. And she looks at me as if I'm stupid. She says, cheeses was not Swiss. Cheeses was the son of God. And I was like, oh, you mean Jesus? Because to my English ear, there's a huge difference between J and Ch. But for Swiss Germans, it's very hard because J is a Y and Ch is a Ch. So they have neither sound. Of course, my Swiss colleagues were helpless on the floor laughing. No one came to my aid. I was just left thinking, well, it was clear to me she was asking for recipe books on Emmentaler and it was clear to her she was wanting religious books. When I told that story a few years ago in Zurich, this guy came up to me afterwards and he said, thank you for recognizing my own personal hell. He said, my name is Jerry. And for three years, I have been Cherry. <laughs> and the first time it happened, someone said, hi, Cherry. And I literally looked over my shoulder for the woman called Cherry, who was not there. And now to make my life much simpler, I just introduced myself as Cherry to get over the stumbling block, which obviously is a bit of a strange name for a man, but it gets over the problem. So just to tell you a little bit about the books, which is why we're here in a bookshop, um, next slide. The newest book is Cartographica Helvetica, which is a book aimed at children, sort of 9 to 14, but actually aimed at children 9 to 99, because it's full of information about everything about Switzerland, partly as a way to introduce topics to children, so like politics, women's rights, foreigners, war and peace, but also anything to do with Switzerland, so geography, tourism, mountains. There are 20 maps, all of which are drawn specially for the book. And then cool infographics. Next slide for a cool infographic. Oh, no, that's a map, actually. So this is the first map. Uh, the very first chapter deals with the geography of Switzerland, how it became the way it is, what is a canton. And then also fun facts like nowhere in Switzerland is more than 69 kilometers from the international border because of the wiggly shape. Um, and then cool infographics. So this is what a typical Swiss person eats in a whole year. You can tell the Swiss because only 160 cups of tea. I mean, that's just embarrassing. Uh, whereas over a thousand cups of coffee. So that's three a day, pretty much. Um, 10 kilos of chocolate a year. They are the world's number one chocolate eaters. And that's actually more than tomatoes or carrots. So I'm sure in Switzerland, chocolate does count as one of your five a day. 
So the whole book's full of things like that. Um, and then each canton gets its own little turn of uh, fame in the back. Uh, we have plenty of copies here and the shop would love you to buy one. I would love to sell them. You have to pay the shop for the book. I will sign it for free. Um, the other new book, so I mentioned the other books, all of which can be ordered either from the shop, they will be able to get all of them. They're all available here in America. Or if you actually want a signed copy, because we don't have the other books here this evening, at the end, I will tell you how to get signed copies. So the other book, which sadly came out during the pandemic, so sort of disappeared without trace. Um, my 52 favorite places in Switzerland. It started as a souvenir book for tourists and then obviously tourists disappeared. And so it became a bucket list for foreigners, expats living in Switzerland so that they could see one place every weekend throughout a year. And there are really beautiful places in there. The ones you expect to be in there like Lake Geneva, Matterhorn, the ones that I really have no choice but to include like Zurich and Basel. Um, and then the little surprises, like the next slide, um, this amazing church in the middle of nowhere in Ticino. I mean, it's literally two hours drive from anywhere. And it's a tiny church. It would probably fit in this room, designed by Mario Botta, all in black and white marble. And it is truly stunning. And so I had to include it. Um, and it's definitely worth the trip, not just to go to Ticino and have a bit of Italian, uh, but also to see amazing architecture like this. And then the last three books are the older books, which some of you may have seen already, or actually two of them I did events in Washington over the years. So the one you've seen a couple of maps from around Switzerland and 80 maps, it's a big coffee table book. It weighs two kilos. Um, it took two years of my life to create. And it is exactly what it says on the cover, 80 maps of Switzerland from that very first map you saw all the way through to NASA satellite map of Switzerland from space today. And in between there are all sorts of maps, military maps, lots of statistical maps. So the pig map is in there, of course. And then maps that have never really seen the light of day, um, but I found them in archives around the country and they're in the book. The book in the middle is Slow Train to Switzerland, which is the story of how tourism began. So it's a story of one man called Thomas Cook, who was a real person before he was a travel agent. And he created modern tourism. He took the first ever package tourists to Switzerland in 1863. And they went on a three week tour very rudimentary. They didn't really know where they're going, what they were seeing, what they were doing, where they were staying. They traveled by train where there was train, but there weren't many trains. So they hiked a lot of the way. And these were Victorian women in crinoline cages, hiking through the Alps for 14 hours, very Swiss. Um, luckily, a woman on that tour wrote a diary and the diary was in the Thomas Cook archives. And I used the diary and followed the same route to see how much had changed. So it's kind of twin travelogues, 150 years apart, but also social history because tourism helped Switzerland become the country it is. It's the reason the train lines were built. It's the reason the rural areas were brought up out of poverty because tourist money flooded in in the 50 years between the beginning of tourism and the First World War. And the last book, uh, Swiss Watching, which was my first book. And it's really a biography of Switzerland. It talks about the culture and the politics and the history, also all those cliches we have. So a whole chapter is about Heidi and me wandering around Switzerland looking for the real Heidi, um, but also trains and cheese and chocolate. And my experience is living there as a foreigner, trying to integrate, so learning the language, dealing with how to say hello at dinner parties and things like that. All of those are available to order here or online. Um, I think the next slide is, oh, just, yes, just to show you, I am digital. I am 21st century. I don't only do paper. So all of that online, you can find me, but also my favorite Swiss joke. Yes, the Swiss do tell jokes. It is not an urban myth. An English girl, a French girl, and a Swiss girl are discussing where babies come from. The English girl says, in England, the stork brings the babies. The French girl says, in France, mama and papa go to bed early, and nine months later, there is a new child. The Swiss girl says, with us, it differs from canton to canton, <laughs> which pretty much sums up the Swiss attitude to life. And then lastly, um, if you do actually want signed copies of anything other than the new book, 
Um, I've come up with a cunning way for you to do that, to also support a really good cause. Obviously, if you're not bothered about my signature, and I wouldn't be too much, um, you can get them from the bookshop here. But if you'd like a signed copy, just email Beth Zurbuchen, um, who is the president of the Swiss Center of North America in New Glarus, Wisconsin. It's a nonprofit cultural organization dedicated to sustaining Swiss culture in North America. It's a great place. I go there every year. I will be there at the end of this month. So not every year, every time I'm in America. I will go there at the end of this month, have an event there, and we'll be able to sign books, which Beth can then ship to you. So just email her info at the swisscenter.org or find the website, the swisscenter.org, and she will be able to organize whatever books, you, sign books you want. I'll sign them when I'm there, even with dedications, and then she will ship them direct to you. So that's it. Now it's your chance to ask questions about anything to do with Switzerland or about writing or about why I'm here or how I ended up in Switzerland, whatever you want. There are no wrong questions. Someone must have one. Edwin. I have one. Um, it's And it, this is a, a delicate question because it's something I, I struggle with a bit. Um, talking about World War II in Switzerland, it's, it seems to me that it's something from my experience that one never brings up. And I'm just wondering what your experience was. Um, to a certain extent, I think yes, because it is uncomfortable, it's delicate. Not, I think, and I say in Swiss watching, and I researched it very carefully, and I spoke to older generation Swiss people um, as well, and all my friends uh, read the, the chapter in question because I wanted it to be clear. I would say there's, the, there's two issues. One is what happened with uh, Jewish refugees. So the famous phrase, the boat is full. So they were turned away at the border. Now, a lot of other countries weren't much better, but Switzerland, because it was neutral, it, I think it was had higher expectations. Well, the, elsewhere had higher expectations of it, but it was a small, relatively poor country. I think the, the bigger issue is what happened with Nazi gold or bank deposits or the, the Nazi gold is usually a phrase to mean lots of different things. Um, and the whole is, issue of banking secrecy. Now, I'm not an economist, I'm not a banker. And I try to see both sides. Um, I think the issue is probably not what Switzerland did during the war, it's what Switzerland did after the war. So during the war, they were surrounded, they were cut off, they tried to be neutral, but they were cut off from the Allies completely. Um, and you had to live with this neighbor that was surrounding you. Uh, so you did what you had to do to survive and to stop being invaded. And banking secrecy, I think some people forget when it was introduced into the constitution in 1934, it was actually there because of what's happening in Germany it was one reason. So people were unsure of, especially Jewish families were unsure of what would happen to their money after Hitler came to power in 1933. So Switzerland was a safe bet once banking secrecy came in and because it was neutral and had not been invaded for a hundred and something years. And so there was no chance or very small chance of the Nazis walking in and possessing everything like they did in the Netherlands or Belgium. So a lot of Jewish people, a lot of Jewish families and businesses used Swiss secrecy to their benefit in the 30s, for obvious reasons. Now, fast forward 40, 50 years, and the Swiss have a problem because they're being very Swiss, uh, crossing every T, dotting every I. So they want to prove who owns the money in their accounts. They want death certificates from people who died in concentration camps, and obviously they aren't. And it's you can see the problem is that if you came along and said, you are my son and I'm dead, I've got no proof that I'm dead, but I died in Auschwitz, then how do the Swiss know that we're related or whatever? And you can see their problem in dealing with it. And it all came to a head, as I'm sure you know, uh, in the 90s and with the Senate and uh, here in the US. And a solution was found. But it is, and then there was a report in Switzerland which caused a minor earthquake about what the Swiss did during the war. 
And it is still a sensitive subject, I think, um, for a lot of, especially older Swiss people. And I think also because banking secrecy is still a sensitive subject. And there, I think the Swiss have a point in that because they are quite upfront about it um, and is not shady like shell companies in Delaware or the Channel Island bank accounts or the Panama Papers have shown us how many uh, dodgy bank accounts there are, especially for rich people who know tax loopholes um, anywhere in the world, not only in Switzerland. So I think a lot of Swiss people think the rest of the world is being rather hypocritical, especially Britain and America, because the Cayman Islands or Channel Islands, you've got ways to hide your money. And they have cleaned that cleaned up their act a little bit. Um, you, even if you see it in James Bond films or read it in novels, you can't just turn up with a suitcase of money and open a numbered account. There is such thing as provenance now. And I have a Swiss bank account. It has my name on it, but that doesn't mean you can find out any information about it any more than I can find out any information about your American bank account. So banking secrecy exists in every country, but it's a sensitive subject. And I think sometimes it's uh, used to sledgehammer Switzerland fairly or unfairly. I think they have a point. I think they could do more. Um, it's always interesting for me, like during the Arab Spring, suddenly all these bank accounts belonging to Arab dictators or African dictators, they suddenly knew about them and froze them. And it was clear that it was embezzled money from that country. So why not do something before? It's difficult. But that's where the criticism often comes from. And I think you can look at it from both sides and try and take a, a view without getting too um, sledgehammery about it. I was trying to be uh, diplomatic, but also authentic, and it's quite hard which is why I could never be neutral. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Yes, sir. In, in Switzerland, um, how, how have your writings been perceived by... Oh, Switzerland? I love that question. I didn't plant it, by the way. He just <laughs> he thought of that all on his own. Um, how, how is my writing being perceived? Luckily, 99% positive. Um, so especially when Swiss Watching came out, um, became a bestseller in Switzerland even before it was translated. I was on the evening news, I was on the front page of the paper, this weird Englishman writing about Switzerland even though he's not Swiss, as I wasn't in those days, and with a sense of humour, so actually getting the Swiss to laugh about themselves. Um, and I got a lot of positive feedback, so one woman wrote to me and said, I was reading your book on the tram in St. Gallen, which is a city in eastern Switzerland, and I laughed out loud for the first time <laughs> in my life on public transport. So I thought it was rather sweet that she wrote to tell me that, but then I thought it was rather sad that she waited. I mean, she might be 80 for all I know. She waited all that time to laugh out loud in public. But at least I made that happen. Um, but there's always a downside, uh, especially these days. And so I, I do get hate mail, uh, usually written in block capitals, shouting at me. I do get occasional trolls on Twitter um, who don't like what I write. Um, I had, when, when Swiss Watching first came out, I was still working in the bookshop, so people could find me to get signed copies. It was relatively easy. More embarrassingly, want selfies and things like that. And then even worse is when they came to harangue me about something I'd written, um, often about the war. So one older man came in and said, you've lied completely about the war. We saved Europe from Nazism. We gave Europe freedom. And I'm like, well, kind of, but not really. Um, which, he, which wasn't the right answer, obviously. Um, and he got really annoyed and we had to call security and I mean, he was shouting at the top of his voice. And one woman um, bought the book uh, and then a few minutes later came back and asked for a refund from me to my face because she had realized that Swiss Watching, my first book was dedicated to Gregor, my boyfriend, and I talk about him as my boyfriend in the book. She said, if I had known it was written by one of you, I would never have bought it. So can I have my money back? So of course you get that in every country. I think one of the interesting things about Switzerland is there isn't much political correctness. There is quite, in Germany you say klartext, so free speech, you say what you want. You say what you mean, you mean what you say. Um, some political posters in Switzerland would be illegal in other countries. The famous black sheep poster, for instance, three white sheep kicking a black sheep off the flag. 
So sometimes it's hard. I grew up in Britain, which is very similar to America, in that offensive language like that, uh, you just don't use in public anymore, especially not in a bookshop. I mean, really. Um, so yes, there has been some negative reaction, uh, but luckily it's a small minority. Um, and usually it boils down to the fact that I'm a foreigner, the fact that I'm gay, or the fact that I write about Switzerland, or the best ones are all three. They hate the fact that I'm a gay foreigner writing about Switzerland. <laughs> so those ones I really treasure because they found every possible reason to hate me and tell me. I mean, they have to Google me, find my website, fill out the contact page, say, yes, I'm not a robot, and do all that to send me hate mail. But luckily, it's a tiny, tiny minority, a very vocal minority, but a tiny minority, because most of the feedback, by far the majority, has been positive. Before pandemic, I was doing events like this two or three times around Switzerland with expat groups, with tourist boards, with companies who employ foreigners and Swiss side by side, and they don't really understand each other. Um, and it was fun, and it was always a mixed audience, and it was always really interesting to see the reaction. And the very typical reaction from most Swiss people is, it's lovely to look at myself in the mirror and see myself and my country as other people see it or see me for the first time because things like saying hello or saying cheers or shaking hands or not queuing for the bus which is my biggest bugbear in switzerland it's like queuing is part of my dna i'm british i form a queue of one at a bus stop if i'm on my own switzerland queuing is just not part of the culture at all and it's really hard for me but all those things which if you grow up there are normal because i didn't grow up there are completely different for me not wrong just different well apart from curing that is wrong um and so it's just i think it takes an outsider to point out those things but from a place of love it's not criticism it's just saying this is different and i kind of like it i've got used to it i now get annoyed if trains aren't on on time don't run on time which in britain and america they hardly ever do so i'm annoyed most of the time when i'm traveling in britain and america whereas in switzerland it's what do you mean it's three minutes late? I'm going to miss my connection because my connection is in five minutes and that's how precise the trains are. So yes, I think uh, it's nice to have that positive feedback, obviously. And it's nice that all the books have sold well, even outside Switzerland. Any other questions? Nope. So this is your chance to buy all these books. <laughs> and, and uh, keep the bookshop happy. I also am very conscious that some Swiss people, I have learned this over the years, do not like asking questions in public, They're putting their hand up, putting their head over the parapet. So if you have a question you'd like to ask in private, you can just come and whisper in my ear and I will answer it, not in front of everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, so much, Logan, for, for that wonderful presentation. Everyone, thank you for joining us today. Feel free to, to mingle around and chat um, and grab your copies of the book. If you have any private questions to whisper, you know, now is your chance. Um, if I pre-order them, they're down there. This is, um, Anna's got some books she bought. She's going to go get okay. them and bring them up. That's but, fine, as long as it's fine in the shop. But this is her copy of Swiss Watch. Okay. And it's to Anna. How do you spell? ADA. 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 Yeah, and I did have 